from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 56, recorded on March 3rd, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack. It's called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to take a closer look of his latest, at his latest column, The Death in Texas. So, Paul, tell us what's happening in this measles outbreak in West Texas. So it's a Mennonite community in West Texas around Gaines County that um, has an immunization rate of around 80% which was fertile ground then for measles to spread. So it's spread now throughout that community. It's caused about 150 cases, including one death. And that is notable because we have not had a child die of measles in this country since 2003, more than 20 years ago. And I think that's what makes this especially upsetting. Uh, not, Not that any child death is not upsetting, but here's a preventable death, completely safely preventable death that occurred, sadly. What percentage of the population should be vaccinated to uh, get protection? Right, so measles is the most contagious infectious disease. It has an, a reproducibility index or a contagiousness index, if you will, of, of 18, meaning you'll infect 18 people uh, during the day, assuming everybody you come in contact with is susceptible as compared to COVID or influenza or RSV, which are sort of more in the two to four range. So um, you need about 95% of a population to be uh, uh, immunized if you're going to uh, stop the spread from one person to the next. And remember, not everybody can be immunized because they're getting cancer chemotherapy or they're too young to have gotten a vaccine Um, or they're getting immune suppressive therapy for their autoimmune or rheumatologic diseases. So really, there are a lot of people out there who depend on the herd to protect them. So the, the cases in Texas, are they all children? You know, it's hard to get information, uh, uh, sadly. I mean, the best the best source of information, frankly, is local newspapers. If you go to the CDC, you, they're generally very slow to, or they have been slow to pick up on the numbers. Um, I assume it's it's mostly children. Uh, my sense is that it's children between seven and nineteen. I mean, I've I've read that in one local newspaper. But again, you don't know the details of the the death. I presume it's measles pneumonia because that's the most likely cause. So if uh, if an adult contracted measles, would they also do adults die of measles or is it mainly children? No, sure. I mean, adults actually, when they get measles pneumonia, are 10 times more likely to die than mm-hmm. children. OK, so uh, there was a meeting at the White House last week and the president was asked about the outbreak. He said, Bobby, can you take this? And um, so <laughs> RFK Jr. said outbreaks happen all the time referring to measles. There have been four measles outbreaks this year in this country last year that were 16. So it's not unusual. We have measles outbreaks every year. Is that true? Well, certainly before there was a measles vaccine in 1963, they happened all the time. Then we had a measles vaccine that came in in 1963, and we had the last best measles vaccine in 1968. And associated with that, you saw a dramatic drop in cases. Then what happened sort of in in the late 80s, we had sort of an increase in measles cases. Between 89 and 91, we had 50,000 hospitalizations and 160 deaths from measles in the United States. Around that time, we had a second dose recommendation. If you looked at those outbreaks in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, it was almost always in people who weren't vaccinated at all. But nonetheless, we had a second dose recommendation, which at the very least gave children a second chance to get a first dose. So now you had a vaccine that was recommended to be given between 12 and 15 months of age and a second dose between four and six years of age. And then within really about nine or 10 years, we eliminated measles from this country, which means that there was no spread of the virus from one American child to the next. Now, measles comes into this country all the time because there's 
millions and millions of cases of measles in the world and tens of thousands of deaths from measles in the world. So measles certainly comes in because international travel is common, but it never sort of took hold because we had a high level of population or herd immunity. So we eliminated measles by the year 2000. So when RFK Jr. sort of glibly says, well, measles outbreaks occur all the time, that's not true. We eliminated measles by the year 2000. What's happened since then, however, is that there's been an erosion in vaccine rates, um, in part because I think not only have we largely eliminated measles, we've eliminated the memory of measles. And so people don't remember how sick that virus can make you, but also in large part because people have unrealistic fears about the vaccine in terms of its safety. He also said in this uh, meeting for which he seemed to be uh, incredibly unprepared, he said the hospitalizations in Texas were due to quarantine. We're watching it, and uh, there, there are about 20 people hospitalized, mainly for quarantine. Is that correct? No, they were due because they were due to the fact that children had measles pneumonia, as one of the physicians there said. No, when you're exposed to measles, and um, you, you need to be quarantined depending on uh, what the, the recommendation could be that you're quarantined for up to 21 days because the incubation period can be that long. But where are you quarantined? You're quarantined in the home. The last place you wouldn't want someone to be quarantined who may get measles is in the hospital because you're around a vulnerable population of children, many of whom can't be vaccinated, and many of whom are especially susceptible to dying from the disease. The last place you would quarantine somebody is in the hospital. I mean, during the measles epidemic in Philadelphia in 1991, when we had 1,400 cases and nine deaths from measles, we were overwhelmed with that virus, as was St. Christopher's Hospital. So we, we did everything we could to keep children out of the hospital. So if the children were mildly dehydrated, you would keep them in front of you to make sure they could drink before you sent them out. Or even if they had, you know, sort of a little short of breath, but they, you know, were able, their oxygenation was good, mm -hmm. you know, you, would, you, you wouldn't bring them into the hospital when you were overwhelmed with that virus. So I don't know what he's talking about. Does he think he's going to be able to give misinformation through every outbreak like this? You know, you, you would think that there are limits to free speech. That, that the, the old line, right, is that um, you can't shout fire in a crowded movie theater because it peeps, puts people at risk. I don't see this, frankly, as any different. That when you give misinformation during an epidemic, for example, and, you, and people then choose not to get a vaccine because of the misinformation you've given them, I don't see how that's any different. It's not the first time he's downplayed measles outbreaks, right? No, I mean, quite the opposite. When he, he, I think what most people don't realize, and I know this because I live in Philadelphia, and, which is right near Lancaster County, which is home to a huge Mennonite and Amish population. And my daughter-in-law actually grew up in that population, so I'm to some extent familiar with it. Um, that is a huge Mennonite population. So, so in August of 2021, in the heart of the COVID pandemic, RFK Jr. stood in front of 1,500 people in a Mennonite community in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and talked about the dangers of vaccines, talked about the danger of the hepatitis B vaccine, talked about how vaccines weren't adequately tested for sa safety in the heart of the COVID pandemic, basically arguing against even giving the COVID uh, vaccine at that time. And so he is well-versed in scaring Mennonite populations. And it's just ironic that now that he's head of health and human services, you have an outbreak in the Mennonite population, in large part because these sequestered populations are especially susceptible, vulnerable to this kind of disinformation. He also advised the Samoan government not to vaccinate against measles, right? He certainly didn't promote measles vaccination when he was in Samoa. He argued that the outbreak wasn't caused by measles. It was caused in his, as he said in the letter he wrote to the Samoan prime minister, a defective measles vaccine. He argued for giving vitamin A. And when he was in the, the Lancaster County community, he sort of made fun of of. of of, how, of the seriousness of measles, saying that, um, you know, that when he had measles as a child, because he's, um, he's a child of the 1950s, he was born in 1954, so it's likely he had measles, that he got to be home with his brothers and sisters, and he got to watch television, and just imagine how horrible that was. So it just, even, and this was two years after the Samoa outbreak, where he saw 83 people, mostly children less than four, die of measles, and still, two years later, he stands up in front of a Lancaster County community, a Mennonite community, and just talks about how trivial measles infections are. So tell us why, in fact, measles infections are not trivial. 
Well, before there was a vaccine, every year there would be about three to four million cases. There would be 48,000 hospitalizations, primarily from measles pneumonia, to a lesser extent from measles uh, dehydration, and to an even lesser extent from encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. Uh, there would be about 1,000 cases of that per year, and um, about a quarter of those children would be left blind or deaf. So uh, again, terrible. Um, then when we had the, the vaccine and the second dose vaccine, and we, we lowered the risk of measles in this country, realized that this, this, uh, this disease can also cause something else. So measles, measles deaths, measles hospitalizations is about anywhere from one to three to one to five people who are infected, seriously. For measles hospitalizations, it's about, um, a measles deaths rather, is about one per thousand. So one of a thousand people who, who are infected with measles will die from the disease. There's another disease, which is called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, or SSPE. That occurs in roughly one per 100,000 people. And I've seen five cases. I mean, it's, it's rare, but it's real, and it is hard to watch. I mean, what happens is you, you recover from your measles infection as a child, and then five years later, seven years later, 10 years later, you start to develop subtle changes in your personality. Your handwriting deteriorates. Then you lose motor skills, then you lose sensory skills, and then you descend into a vegetative state and never recover. I mean, it is a uniformly, universally fatal disease. And um, I think maybe if we had um, some parent talking about that or film of that so pe people could see just how bad measles can be, um, we'd be a little more uh, concerned about uh, protecting our children against this infection. Of course, then we more recently learned that measles erases our immune memory. That's right. And you can, and that's the other thing you can see, which is you can see um, invasive bacterial disease um, soon after, because it, can, it's, it has an immune suppressive effect. It's interesting that RFK Jr. recently said that, um, that, and has said, not just recently, but for a long time, that the reason that measles decreased was because of, of better sanitation and better nutrition. That's not true. The reason measles decreased from the early 1900s, where you'd have 6,000 deaths a year to, say, before the vaccine to about 500 deaths a year, was the invention of antibiotics to treat secondary bacterial mm -hmm. infections. So what should RFK Jr. have said at this meeting? What he should have said is he should have said right away, he should have said, a death from a vaccine preventable disease is a tragedy. This is unacceptable. And we have many pockets in this country, like the Mennonite population in West Africa, that are under vaccinated. We too have to stand up and at the top of our lungs say, we need to make sure people are vaccinated because this is preventable. Medicine's hard enough. There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we can't, can't, can't do. This we know. But he didn't, at least not initially. He since has had an op-ed piece uh, that it was delivered uh, on Fox News um, about where he did say that um, that death was a tragedy. He did say he called the parents. But again, he was very soft on call, a call to arms for vaccination. He's probably told to write that op-ed to try and repair the damage. When I, I can't believe he's in charge of the nation's health, Paul. When are people going to be outraged? When is Congress going to be outraged? And even the president should say, Bobby, get a hold of this. Would that ever happen? Well, certainly measles doesn't care about your religious, or, uh, measles doesn't care about your religious affiliations or your political affiliations. Mm -hmm. So uh, measles is perfectly willing to uh, infect and harm children of Democrats and Republicans in all states. So I, I, maybe it just has to get worse, um, much worse, before mm -hmm. people will be uh, affected by this. I don't, you know, it, it's interesting that, that people have asked me, so like, how many people do, how many children would have to die, for example, before we woke up here? And, and, and in part, the answer, at least for me, is like, how many children have to die in mass shootings before we have gun control? I would have thought the Sandy Hook shootings would have ended, you know, this and yeah. really been a call to arms for gun control. It wasn't. But I think people see infectious diseases differently. Uh, I, I do think people are scared of infectious diseases. One, because um, you know, they, they infect, they, they affect children, including young children and cause death. And I just, I think we respond to infections differently. We'll see. I really also think, I do not think this is something that, that is a good look for Donald Trump. I don't think children dying of measles in the United States is a good look for Donald Trump. And we'll see whether, if this continues to what extent RFK Jr. remains viable as a head of HHS. Well, there are other viruses out there, as you know. Uh, I would 
I think it's a matter of time before we have a case of polio somewhere here in the U.S. And uh, if people don't get their flu vaccines on time, which looks realistic, then we're going to have big outbreaks of uh, influenza as well. So the infectious disease landscape is going to be perceived as out of control in the U.S. I don't know how any lawmaker can be content with that. You're right. And when RFK Jr. said, as he did uh, when he was running for the president, we need to give infectious diseases a break for eight years, they're certainly not going to be giving us a break. No, we could give them a break, but they, <laughs> they won't give us a break. Right. Oh, my gosh, Paul. You can find Paul Offit at Beyond the Noise on Substack. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.